Okay, so we've got six speakers tonight. So this is the members chat part of the, uh, the evening. We've got six speakers. Okay, so this is the site that I use pretty much every day of the week um, to do my um, World War II history uh, research and any other type of research that I do. I usually just log in as a guest. You, know, you can register, um, but I usually log in as a guest, so I'll, I'll just log in as a guest. And there's a couple of types of searches. There's the basic search, which is all I'll be using tonight. So you type in a keyword and, and there's a date sequence if you want to use that as well. There is an advanced search, which I'll just show you, and you can search by uh, different types of searches. Um, but I won't use that tonight. There's a name search. There's a photo search, which can be handy if you want to find something. And uh, if you're after ancestors, there's a passenger and... They also let you know that they've got a program where they're scanning um, documents all the time and they have this section where they show you what the most recent uh, documents were that were, have been scanned. Uh, I rarely, actually rarely look at that. Um, my interest is restricted to World War II, so the things I look for are RAF, RAAF war diaries, which are basically operations record books or ORBs you might hear them called um, um, army uh, diaries uh, well so the RAF ones are stored on the National Archives website if you're after army do diaries I'll just sort of go off topic a little bit they're all held on the Australian War Memorial site so if you want to find a, a war diary for a World War II army unit Australian Army unit, you go to this site, Just if you just do a search for AWM War Diaries you'll find it and um, so if you wanted to look for um, say a battalion you go to the infantry and you go to uh, battalions, you do brigades if you want to uh, and then all of these are digitised diaries so you click on them and then you get a date range and you can actually then load that particular diary and um, have a look at that diary so um, as I said I won't uh, and you can download it there's a download button there but I'll go back to the RAF I'll do a search for operations record book now just a word of warning the National Archives are not very good with their indexing and sometimes they might call them operational record books um, so it's um, a bit hit and miss occasionally uh, to find something. So I've just done that search for Operation Record Book and it's come back with 1,010 records. Okay, Now the ones that are digitised are the ones that have got this little symbol here which means it's a digitised file. So the one they're the only ones I'm interested in so what I do is click on the top of this column here, Digitised Item, and then that sorts them so that all the digitised files are at the front. Um, so um, what I also what what you can also do is click on the refine research, and then limit it to the which I normally do limit it to the World War II era. Do a search again, uh, sort that column there, and now. Um, it's dropped it from 1,010 down to 670 um, 70 items. What you can do is click on these links and it will open up um, those digitised records. I'll, I'll, I've actually got one pre-arranged. It's a cover page, so I'll just click ahead to a couple of pages and I'll, I'll dive ahead actually. Oh, I'll go to... I'll go to the start so you can see where it starts. So it says that number 84 uh, Army Cooperation Wing Headquarters was formed as a lodge unit at 25 Operational Base Unit in Cairns under the establishment of that, that establishment which gives you the number of people they're allowed to have, etc, etc. Um, you, 
you can download each of these pages um, sometimes back on this this page here uh, oh no that's different I'm thinking of the War Memorial site so I'll just go to a, another page here page 20 it's just for a bit of comic relief um, is that the right page that's not the right page uh, 32 sorry 32 So th these are usually full of operational stuff. Um, the, the squadron, uh, the flying squadrons will have details on aircraft and missions and day-to-day -day stuff and postings, etc. But sometimes they get a bit um, down to earth. So what have we got here? No, no pr practical jokes were perpetrated today. So this is at Torokina on the 1st of April 1945. Heads were too heavy for light thoughts as a result of opening of the officers' mess last night. Owing to a misunderstanding or perhaps a lack of understanding of the accent, English accent, one of one of our visitors from the British fleet, so the British Pacific Fleet were in the, uh, our neck of the woods uh, in early 1945, the mess sergeant instituted a new fashion, the serving of beer for breakfast. Funny at the time, the joke lost its point when it was realised that one of our valuable and scarce pieces of equipment had gone down a foreign drain. Anyway, so that's just a, a bit of a demo of... Um, um, so has anyone got a, um, a particular unit they'd perhaps like me to try and see whether there is a digitised file for a unit that they might be interested in? Yes, Peter. What about um, the RAF 87 squadron, which was involved in aerial survey? Yeah. Um, so there's um, 87 Squadron, October 39 to October 1949. So there's 287 pages. So I'll just go forward a little bit uh, to page 20. So go back. Yeah, so that one's there, Roger. There's actually um, also a, a second file. Oh, there's three files, actually. Um, there's another file. Here's the other file. There's only two, sorry. Um, that's got Peter, I'm, I'm interested in 1950, and I hear that you mentioned it seemed to cover only up to 49. Well, this one here that I've just loaded goes to October 53. Okay, so if I go to, say, page 400... We'll see what date it is. Uh, 1953, go back to 300. Um, 1946, go to 350, 350 maybe. Um, what year is that? Doesn't say the year. Yep, it's upside down. There's 51, so 50 will be there somewhere. Thank you for that. No worries. If you want to send me an email, I can send you the link later. Um, one of the... I'll share a different... Um, I'll just stop that share and I'll just share something else which I hadn't planned to show, but I will show it to you. Where is it? Pete, I, I just noticed that uh, World War II, they showed up as operational records and post-war they came up as unit history sheets. They're different um, terminology yeah, at the top. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so I'll just... Uh, can you see this? Uh, uh, hang on, I'll go to the start. Thing titled yeah, RAF, yeah. Orbs, RAF Orbs and Unit History, Form 50. This is a file that I spent... Um, many months. It's actually uh, something that I sell for a couple of dollars on on the internet. But it's it's more or less a um, uh, quick finding tool to find records for RAF units that are uh, on the National Archives site. So I've gone through all their their indexes and put all the um, the units that are digitised into this file and provided links from each of them. And as I said, the, the, the National Archives aren't really very good at um, 
recording um, you know the correct title so some of the records um, for the Queensland University Squadron for instance are labelled New South Wales University Squadron um, so in this file that I've produced I've uh, I've put the correct titles so you can see um, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of files uh, lots lots of units so the, all of these are, um, are digitized digitized files and you can just click on them and go straight to the National Archives link okay so that's the end of my little talk any, uh, any questions Question on that uh, yeah. up on those records, up to how recently do they have them in the archives? Uh, well, there are some modern ones. Uh, my, well, there's, I can see one here, 1988, 19, yeah, 1988, um, 1978, 1966. Um, so there are some in the last century, but I doubt there'd be any in the 2000s. Um, 1987. So it's it's a good resource. Um, it's worth looking at if you if you're chasing any old RAAF history. Yeah, I um, Peter, I, I use it all the time as well, like every week. Yeah. Uh, but there's some there is some idiosyncrasies that you in it. The um, uh, the it's very much the a, a copy of the documents as received by headquarters. It's not a copy of the document as retained by the unit. <laughs> uh, we've got, uh, uh, th and the best examples are annexes. When you read them, um, it'll re refer to an annex, but invariably the annex isn't uh, included in the National Archives uh, record. Yeah. Um, and um, sometimes they are, but often they're not. So I've, I've checked that against uh, unit history records that still exist at Ambly, and Ambly will have you know photographs of visits that are mentioned in the text, um, but um, yeah, uh, if you went to uh, what's headquarters, one of the wings, it's probably that one, 82 wings, and I've also got the 3 AD yeah. one. So if you open that up. Uh, I'll yeah. open it, but uh, but you won't see it because it'll open it in a different window. But I'll I'll share that window. Okay. So I'll stop that share and I'll share that window, which is that page there. And now you can see it. I hope. <laughs> yep. Yes. Um, but if you were to so that's, find that's the eight hundred and fifty-two pages, by the way. Yeah. The other thing is uh, the units also had uh, commanding officers report. So um, that's one of the monthly tasks of the commanding officer. And certainly during World War II, that report was just uh, an addendum at the end of the month on all the uh, operational record sheets. So you get to see the commanding officers yeah. uh, more verbalized description of what happened in there. Yeah. Very descriptive in the Second World War. Yeah, it varies from unit to unit. Some units, uh, the person who wrote these uh, orbs put very little information um, yeah. and some just went overboard with everything, you know, like real personal stuff and parties and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So it's quite a variety of, of detail depending on the unit involved. The army uh, records in the first world war uh, had uh, the battalion records had an enormous amount of detail. The, the contrast is, mm. is huge between battalions, Yeah, but one that I was researching even had a copy of their, uh, monthly newspaper that okay. they published every month in there. Yeah. Fantastic record. Some and it meant things. that that unit, I'm sure, would get dominance, predominance in history. Yeah. Because some the detail is there. Some of these army records, uh, this one's a bit slow loading, they also include maps of where they were camped and places, yeah. things like that. So I often chase some of the camp areas around the Townsville area, you know, Woodstock, Antill Plains and places like Roseneath, places like that, just to find out where all the different camps were because I've found lots of things in that area, including a couple of small concrete bunkers uh, near Roseneath that no one in Townsville knows about, or very few people. Um, 
But yeah, the, the, these army records are quite good as well. They um, have all this sort of detail and then occasionally they'll put in maps of where they were and, and all that stuff and all their, um, their, their reports and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I've, um, well, I've used it. I'll, I'll shut up there. It, 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 it's, it's an excellent resource and you'll find that it's not always consistent, but mm -hmm. just I would recommend people be persistent. Sometimes even the pages aren't scanned in the right sequence. Yes, so, very much so. There's one particular yeah. flying squadron which is all over the bloody place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just be persistent. Keep with it and you'll find what you're looking for or ask Peter or myself. <laughs> I'll dob you in first. Usually the old, well, it's not, no, it's not always usually, but some of them, the older state is at the back of the book and yep. uh, yeah, it, it varies. Okay. I, I think, it? um, sorry, I, I think um, Daryl's point is very good. It's yeah. also too, because I use it too, um, weekly, weekly. Uh, and I've found that the uh, ORBs um, aren't as good as the war diaries from the First World War. Um, and you've got to be careful in terms of, um, I think after the Second World War, some public servants went through and chucked stuff out. Um, and it was just willy nilly. For example, in um, 78 Squadron's ORB, they are missing from about July 44 through to through July 45. It's just not in the ORB. Mm. So someone's gone through and chucked it out. The other thing too is that, um, I know it's a primary source, but people put a lot of or too much emphasis on it because there's mistakes in them. Yeah. And you really need to um, check them against other sources to make sure. Um, and people think that they are, you know, the Gospels, either Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or, or John. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter what other information you bring up of alternative sources. They say, oh, no, because it's in the ORB, it must be right. So, yeah. you, you know. Yeah, I've treat seen, them with respect. I've seen conflicting information. Yeah. Well, yeah. not even, not only that. It's just, um, for example, once again in seventy eight squadron, they mention it's the last combat of of World War Two that happened in June forty four, yeah. and they mentioned there that there were um, fifteen Kitty Hawks took on um, twelve Japanese aircraft fighters and fighter bombers. Um, but we've got no idea where that number came from because when you go back through the combat reports, there were a lot more than 12 Japanese aircraft there. Yeah. But everyone thinks it was 12 and it's in books, it's in magazines for years and years, uh, and it's wrong. Yeah. Okay. No other yeah, questions? Oh, Pete, there's just other one thing I, I often find is that uh, you get the squadron records. When the squadron has a detachment that breaks away from the squadron and goes elsewhere, yeah, how do you retrieve the detachment records? Well, sometimes these orbs will uh, be broken up by location, so they show the detachments, but not always. Yeah, that's that's the only one that's mystified me. That's uh, yeah, yeah. No, well, thanks for that. Okay, so I'll hand over to Daryl. Uh, Daryl, I'll just share this um, Google Earth screen. And you should be able to see a map of, or an aerial view, should I say, of uh, Australia with with uh, all of my markers. I've got tens of thousands of markers uh, all around uh, Australia. When you zoom in, you see a lot more. No, right, no. So can you see those there, Daryl? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Right, uh, you tell me which one to go to. All right, well, but we'll but just start generally. Um, this began with me and, and Peter having a discussion about the presentation I'm going to give mid-year about how to use, uh, whether we can use Google Earth to give you a bit of perspective to the Ginger Lee story. So um, I was the, uh, the last quasi project manager for Ginger Lee facility Alice Springs before it was handed over to the RAF as an operational unit in uh, 1993. Now, even the dates, when I researched the dates, uh, we talk about accuracy and records. Um, I've read one record that says it was 1992, but I'm, I'm sure it was 1993. 
So, um, but what Peter noticed was just how isolated and vast these, uh, you know, remote these places are. And uh, also other people have noticed that, uh, noted that they didn't know they existed. So we thought we would have a, um, a pre-flight, if you like, just through some of the locations. I'm going to try and avoid talking about Jindalee. And this is just uh, doing a, a bit of a, a tour around Australia using uh, Google Earth. So if we go into um, JFAS Hearts Range first, the second one down, just watch it zoom. This is just a little northwest of Alice Springs. All right. So this is 100 plus kilometers out of Alice Springs. And this was the um, uh, original Jindalee transmitter site. So out here, this is where uh, all the energy is put into the sky. Um, it is very remote. It's about uh, 50 kilometers short of uh, the little settlement of Hearts Range. It'll be just to the right um, out there. There we go. So Hearts Range has a, a police station and uh, an Aboriginal settlement. And it's um, quite a, a famous little place out there. It's, it's, um, it's pouted as the, the biggest police district uh, in Australia, just in the area of, that it covers. So this is the transmitter station. Um, it's had upgrades through the years. And uh, it's uh, so remote that the people that operate the facility that is to turn the power on, uh, make sure there's petrol going to the, well, diesel going to the power station, etc. They live out here. So if you slide a little bit down to the bottom left, you'll find what used to be not there, keep going, uh, six or eight houses. So um, the people who operate this station live out there, but they are essentially mechanics and uh, jackaroos, uh, etc. They really are not operating it as uh, an operational unit. They're just making sure it, it, they don't control it. They just operate it, right? And they, as I said, they, they live out there. There's no airfield at this site. No. This is one of the points of the, of the speech. This is, uh, these are no-fly zones you know, around Australia. Um, the transmitter site uh, puts a lot of energy into the sky. Um, so much, I couldn't tell you how many megawatts, it's two or three megawatts uh, into the sky. It uh, is a steered beam, so that's why it, it has a 90 degree, 90 degree spread there, is that left what and these right. Are, these things there? Yeah, there are different, they're supporting the antenna. There's actually two, I'll call it two double sets of antenna for the different um, frequency ranges. Uh -huh. Uh, shorter and longer. It's all high frequency um, transmissions in the high frequency bands, but they're pretty broad. And uh, so those two antenna sets are uh, for the higher and lower ends of the frequency bands. What's that? They, okay, that's new since I uh, was there in the early 1990s. All I know it about of what's new since that era is that these sites are remotely controlled from Adelaide. All right, so now, um, to me, that would be some sort of communications or satellite communications facility. Right. All right, but that wasn't there in the early 1990s. It would, the, uh, there is a shadow in the middle background to the main facilities there. Yeah, around about where your cursor is there. There is a you know, microwave link between the, this, the transmitter site, and 100 kilometers away, exactly, in line with the uh, left to right, with the antennas is the transmitting station, all right? And there's a mountain range in between. Um, we won't go there quite there yet, but if you hold there and you go directly north of the antenna as opposed to, see it's not exactly north, uh, around about the creek there, there's actually a, a bit of a track intersection. There is a homestead in front of the antenna. Yes, there. 
So if you can zoom back and look at how far away that is from the antenna. All right. So that's uh, 10.2 around yeah. about 11 miles. And it's on the pretty much the 90 degree or 45 degrees from center line of the antenna. That's around, that is a safe distance, but um, you've got to understand that the, the beam that's transmitted, even though the, um, they'll tell you it bounces off the ionosphere, it's a very, very shallow beam. Uh, you've, got the, you've got the cleared land immediately in front of the antenna in that, uh, that shape. What are this? Yeah, that, well, the, the cleared, all the scrub cleared of that land in front there. Uh, the, the safety briefing about if you find yourself out in that uh, patch of land when the sirens go off and the radar starts transmitting, uh, just lie down. It uh, doesn't hurt so much when you die. <laughs> So it, it's, it's not transmitting all the time. Yeah. No, it doesn't transmit all the time. We'll talk about that yeah, yeah, in yeah, another talk. talk. Yeah, sure. But sure. Uh, when it is transmitting, all sorts of lights go off, flashing, sirens blare, blare, because uh, they want to scare the animals away as much as anything. Yeah, <laughs> before they kill them. <laughs> all right. Now, uh, one of the things just to show you how, what the country is like and how remote it is, there's the road that comes back out of the Hearts Range and it joins on to Highway 12 there. Can you zoom on in on that? Yeah, just to the left where the, the road from Hearts Range comes. Yeah, yeah just there. Yeah. And just go to um, Street View. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. If you would. Zoom in first. You'll, it'll, it should find it. Yeah. So just, just pan around. So the highway, it's, this is called the Plenty Highway, is a single lane bitumen road. Um, and it, it turns into all dirt just after, just behind us from our view of about five kilometres, it turns into all dirt. But that uh, will regularly, something like, in my day, it was about every fortnight, we'd get a major road tanker worth of fuel uh, diesel delivered to the power station out there. So it needed to be sealed to be able to take that big heavy truck uh, full of fuel to the site. So there's your turn off. Yep. So defence paid for that to be sealed at least that far. Mm. But you can see what the countryside is like. There's nothing there. However, if you zoom back out. Yeah, I'll just uh, get north at the top again. Right. Now, uh, the only thing you'll see along the way in the drive there is a place called Gem Tree Caravan Park. In your search, Peter, can you type in Gem Tree while we're here? How do you spell it? G-E-M. G-E-M. T-R-W-E. Roadhouse. Uh, yeah, that'll be it. Uh, there it is there. So on the way there, you'll drive past this place. It has a swimming pool, which is really a, a dam that's lined with black plastic. Lagoon there, by the way, sir. Yeah, so it's very uh, warm to swim in there. But the yeah. area of- There's an airfield there. Yeah. The area along here is famous for its gems. So for example, the uh, all the roads in Hearts Range itself, that little settlement are named after different gems. So, um, uh, I don't know whether you can, whether there's any cabins for hire out there, but that's the main <laughs> tourist attraction and why you'll see people out there if you do see people at all. And you can land there if you want to. <laughs> well, it's, it really, it's really a wash. If you um, zoom in on it, you'll see all the water washes across it. So uh, don't assume it's in any good condition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you've got a different view than I've got. Why is that? Oh, I had historical view. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. yeah. historical. Yeah. Okay, so like at different times during the past. Yeah, so this is two thousand and twenty-two image according to this. Yeah, that's very new. Okay. At the top of the page, you can select earlier, earlier dates. Yeah, you can go up the top here and go. Uh, I won't do it, but you can. Yeah, don't don't. We, we you might can do go it back through the years. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, if you zoom right back out slowly, yeah, yeah. Uh, because I think you'll have the uh, the other one booked, Mark. But I just want to show you that the orientation of the transmitter. Just at the bottom of the screen there, you'll start to see a big range. That's the heart's range. And that is one of them. Yeah, and there's JFAS on the uh, Mount Everard on the left. Now that's the receiving station. It's quite deliberate that there's a mountain range between the two. All right. Um, what you don't want to get uh, at the receiving station is any, any direct radio interference. Yeah. So you don't want to be seeing the side lobe from the transmissions out of Hart's range. So when they built this, these sites, um, they're very conscious that the, uh, the receiver station has to be ultra quiet. So it's 104 kilometers from Alice Springs. Yeah, that's straight line, yeah. but you have to take that deviation to get there. I think it's about 150 or something yeah. by road. That's why they live out there. They have to be able to turn the radar on you know, somebody will give them a call <laughs> and fire up the pound station and make sure everything's working if, if they need to in the middle of the night. You want to move up the northwest to the other? Uh, well, let's just go to uh, uh, Mount Everard receiver station in there. Now, that's everybody who works there lives in Alice Springs. And you'll see it's quite different. So that's a receiving station and that's a big, long antenna uh, along that. Uh, 2.6 kilometer roadway and if you keep zooming it's got a little on the top edge of that uh, lots of little x's it's an airplane there by the looks of no nah. nah, that's, like that's a little symbol oh, that okay, it's a cross yeah saying this is not an aerodrome <laughs> yes okay yeah. well that's the receiver station uh that was the first one built for Jinder Lee, and that's quite different from the other receiver stations because in the day it was controlled the whole thing was controlled by that site that had an operations room as well as the uh, computer room and uh, uh, train receiving plant and equipment in there mm -hmm. all right but now i was just going to ask for that gender leave seen the mh370 no it was too this gender leave wouldn't have uh, but the other thing is they have the main thing is they have to be turned on and be looking yeah it's, it's looking for it. the way it, it operationally works it's not a, a broad area surveillance that's on all the time it has to be switched on and looking and i can tell you they can't afford to run it 24 7. yeah it'd be very costly <laughs> all right so pick one of the other sites i'd go to the queensland ones long reach uh, right you might have to zoom back to show people where it is. And this is these are out on the black soil plains. Um, well, it's called Stonehenge, uh, but it's a little bit south of little bit south. It's a long way south of Longreach. Is that the Diamantina River? So oh, I don't know which is. There's weak. Winton. Winton up the top here. Yeah. Right. Okay. Got to now. Yeah. The Thompson River coming through Longreach. This, yeah. this is where LBJ did his forced landing in the bush during World War II uh, in the Swiss, just here. Stayed overnight in Winton. So, well, you can see on the right there in Longreach, close to Longreach, is the uh, transmitter. So in this case, the transmitter is to the... I beg your pardon? No, it's, 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 the transmitter is still to the east of the receiver. But if you zoom in there, you'll see the, the general layout on the ground. There you are. Yeah. Got some ponds. Yeah, that's as much. Uh, one of the things you want the, to do is to, is to encourage the cattle or the animals and things in front of the radar to go behind the radar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. um, but there's, there's some things in there like that little pink area near the ponds that I suspect has been uh, modified for public viewing. Yeah. I think I think somebody's played with these images yeah. and we're not seeing exactly what is in that space. Yep. All right. I wonder why we peeked around. <laughs> but this is long reach. And again, uh, but here, uh, anybody 
uh, who was operating that site, um, they would live in Longreach. That's not far away uh, as a commute to work. Is now the long, ones- That's not Longreach, is it? Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah, it is too. Okay. <laughs> so we're up so there's a, Now small. if you go to the uh, receiver station here, the Longreach, uh, it's to the south this one? west, there we are. Stonehenge. There is a little township near strip near there called Townhenge. Stonehenge, sorry. But keep zooming. Uh, you see, there's there's no living quarters here, and there's a whole heap less buildings. Oh. But again, you get this to, to the bow, lower left. Like, looks to me a little adulterated image there, and I'm pretty sure that's the communications set up back. Uh, to the central controls. I couldn't tell you the configuration of those buildings, but that's the receiver out in the middle of nowhere, southwest of Longreach. Mm. All right, now the last set, which is over in Western Australia, now you're gonna see, see something a little bit different. Leonora? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, this is the receiver site at Leonora. I'll just go and back you can out. see. I'll go out a little bit just to oh, look at all that. Yeah, salt plains and things. Oh, mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Yep. I get just go out so people get a feel for where we are. So we're right out in oh. nowhere. These Leonora and, and Labadon in particular are often in summer the hottest places in Australia. Uh, you know, recorded temperatures. In Australia. Little building there. Oh, did Anna Giles put in the road for that, did he? I don't know. <laughs> this is uh, this is uh, the, the, the roads and etc. for Jindalee are only really built in the 1990s. Is that same, but same if same. you look at the uh, antenna here, just zoom back out, Peter. This is the receiver site and it's got this big inverted V. That's actually two antennas. Um, this site is actually two radar sites uh, at 90 degrees to each other. So they can see uh, 100, if you like, a total of 180 degrees from that site, whereas the other two only see in a 45 degree span. All right. Mm -hmm. So if we go then to Abaddon, which our bobsled girl is from. Is she? From one of the Winter Olympics yeah. box yeah. letters. Oh, okay. This from Labadon. And again, you'll see this is the transmitter, and that's actually two transmitters at 90 degrees to each, <laughs> each other. Transmitter antennas that are 90 degrees to each other. Same setup again. Yeah. All right. So the antenna are more noticeable on the ground there, and you'll see there's a lot more of them in both sections of it than at Alice Springs. And you'll see that they go out into two arms out there, all right? So those antennas, each one of them is split into two. So um, each normal station is actually two radars. I, I suppose technically this is four radars. It's, it's simply for tasking, so you can give it two tasks at once to do in the same area. What is all this? Uh, just zoom back. Where are we? Oh, okay. I'll explain that in the, when we talk operationally about it. Okay. But one of the things about how um, the radar works is understanding what's happening at the ionosphere at any particular point in time. You know, map the ionos the ionosphere is the mirror. So to be able to understand where your beam is going, you have to know if the mirror is sloping and what altitude it's at, the reflecting surface. So one of the things that the Gingerlies like to do is to talk to each other and measure the ionosphere directly above them and the, what's happening in the ionosphere between them. And they build uh, a computer model um, of what's happening in the ionosphere. There's also, if you can imagine one of these 
beams bouncing off the ionosphere above Darwin or several other unacknowledged spots around the Australian coast. There are transponders in those sites that are uh, uh, bouncing a beam off the ionosphere, uh, sending the data back to Jindalee. So Jindalee knows what the mirror looks like that it's actually bouncing a beam off um, and over the horizon. Just a bit of conspiracy theory. There's a tunnel there. <laughs> Down ramp into a dark hole. I can tell you when these, places, when these places are hot, one of the things you need is uh, a pre-cooler room for your air conditioning. <laughs> All right. So um, hmm. the uh, it's almost like you need to, overnight you need to build an ice block so that during the day you can run air over the normal outside air over the ice block to pre-cool it and then feed it into the air conditioner for the air conditioner to work. Yep. If that makes sense. <laughs> But that could that could be anything. It actually looks a little bit far away from the main buildings to be a pre cool. Yeah, yeah. But they did talk about tunnels uh, as another way of um, uh, pre cooling your air before it goes into the air conditioner. Oh, okay. We did have days, and I'll talk about this in my major talk, yep. where we had to turn off the radar because our air condition air conditioning broke down above forty four degrees centigrade. It Jeez. wouldn't work. Uh. Uh, and I'd been out there in my dress shoes and my not I, I did take my tie off and my shoes melted to the tarmac. <laughs> not only did the, the polish melt off, but my soles stuck to the tarmac. But that's evidently not an uncommon story for tarmac. <laughs> I expected to see some solar panels out in some of these sites, but haven't spotted so you know, they, they talked about it way even way back when because of the amount of power mm. but you'd need you'd need square miles of solar yeah, yeah, yeah. energy to do it and then what do you do in the morning and in the evening and at night time right. yep. you need a huge yeah i meant power. for local facilities rather than the radar thing yeah yeah, yeah. okay so that's it that's just um showing you how remote these places are and I'll tell you some stories about operating remotely, even about Alice Springs, that um, sort of some of the background story to why it's all controlled now in Adelaide. And I'll tell you some of the human stories that led to the... <laughs> and you talk, yep, yeah. later in the year. Well, just on that, um, if you remember Les Higgins, the Bush Tucker man, <laughs> the Air Force actually had a chapel of Kevin Kavanagh, and his task was to... Uh, uh, explore the the centre of Australia and look for water resources. And I was a sidekick to that originally selected for that particular project, but uh, was given eight six months out there to run around, but never eventuated me for other reasons. But uh, uh, there was this, a study done back there, and probably around about the nineteen eighties. Yeah, Daryl, can I ask you? Uh, I, I I don't want you to buy into what you're going to tell us in June. But uh, I've uh, seen the array of a dozen odd very high uh, masts and so on at Northwest Cape. If I was on the ground at one of these uh, over the over the radar over the horizon, yep. Jindal Lee stuff, what what sort of antenna would I see? Okay, you see masts, uh, but they might only be uh, I'd say 100 to 200 feet high. But what they're doing is holding up a curtain. So from the top of the mast, a line uh, goes uh, to the northwest. All right, a, a cable goes to the northwest. And what's hanging down from that line is the active antenna. A whole heap of strands are, are strung off that line in that direction. And the um, so it's a, it's a curtain. It's an array curtain in the dead center line of, of the array. So you have all these curtains there. And the transmit signal is sent along those channels along the ground into those um, uh, array curtains in a certain pattern that steers the beam, all right? So if you want to go to the beam left, you send the right-hand signal, that microsecond of a, a head, the, the right-hand signal leads the left-hand signal 
and it leaves the antenna first and the left hand side leaves a fraction of a second but it's out of this big curtain so it actually create the beam that leaves is bent by that action that 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 um the way that the signal is is sent down this curtain steers the beam left and right and it's actually very sensitive the um the equipment they've got means that they can steer that beam you know several thousand kilometers and it's only you know 10 or 20 kilometers wide when it hits the ground at the other end it's all right okay we might move on thank you very much okay Riff, um, comment um when i was at al springs my second person in 1980 uh flying northwest of al springs that what that looks like an aerodrome there's no aerodrome like that around and of course it was the uh jindal lee over off the horizon radar but just looked like an ordinary outback airstrip until you were close but about five times as big as the average one and then you got closer still and you saw the heap of antenna it's all over it yeah yeah. I'll, I'll just say a quick note, 1980, my wife drove around Australia, the wife myself on long service leave from the Air Force. I came to the Northwest Cape there and uh, I just saw a, a, a rat vehicle pull up at one of the little shops there to get food and I introduced myself because I, I was Air Force uh, 20 odd years by then. So uh, they, they turned out, the chap said, well, I'll give you the keys to the caretaker's cottage out there. So my wife and I camped out there on site for about a week. We had the whole place to ourselves. It was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just a spider web of antennas, but uh, we often wonder if we get ourselves fried, but, but we came out of it. Just to, just a point on that, in, in the Jindalee, they're really sensitive to the transmitter because being fried, yeah. um, the, the amount of energy that the place puts out. So that's that's why it's a no-go zone on the, on the ground and in the air. But the receiver site is the other end of the scale. They need it to be electronically quiet, benign. Uh, they can tell when a motorbike, uh, you know, within a hundred kilometres, a two-stroke motorbike is is can interfere with their receiver. So, um, yeah, sure. Uh, there's a road behind them there at um, uh, Mount Everard. Go, just goes behind the back, but they'll know when there's a car coming and when it's gone past, um, and it, it annoys the hell out of them at Alice Springs. And that's another reason why the other sites they're well away from any through traffic roads. I don't remember that there was any uh, airborne restricted area to clear the ground or anything like that. Oh, okay. They should be at the receiving, at, at the transmitter, in front of the transmitter. I'm not sure it was not, but I don't remember it. <laughs> yeah. it was, yeah. Well, even, even now, <clears throat> I mean, those things put out a, a tremendous amount of energy uh, in the HF range. Um, I'd be surprised if there isn't at least a warning in there. I had to get special permission near the end of my tour to do a photo reconnaissance flight over them um, because they wanted to have the, um, the, the the historical imagery at the point it was uh, handed over to the RAF. So we had a H, I tasked a HS 748 to fly uh, over both sites and uh, I had to you get all the assurances that the site would not transmit <laughs> when, <laughs> when we went over the top of it uh, or that it wasn't doing it. As it was, the navigator missed the site uh, and he had to turn around and do a second pass over it. Okay. He didn't find it the first time. That's the yeah. transmitter. But I'll show, I'll show you copies of the images we took from that flight. I just made a quick comment. Well, I was on the FL11 project back in 1968, and we used to demonstrate the TFR radar on that, and to show people the the intensity of the beam, we used to get steel wool, uh, you see the old scrub and stuff used in the kitchen, and throw that in front of the tanner, and it it explode in a ball of flames like a sparkler going off. It, it, uh, it, it scared the living bejesus out when you saw the capability what that stuff does, you know. So it, it really meant that you never stood in front of a radar antenna. <laughs> This is a this is a ground based radar where it was all about putting out as much energy as you could. Yep. One of my side stories is, despite the fact that the transmitter had all these flashing lights and uh, sirens go off, the birds got used to it, mm. and they still would roost on the wires when they would uh, go active. Uh, and so, from the the place 
used to stink at times of of roast right. pigeon and <laughs> different mm -hmm. the birds would just fry uh, yeah. immediately on the lines right. okay thanks very much daryl we'll move on because we're running a bit yeah. late probably Um, so I'd like to hand over to Jeff Nielsen now, who's going to talk about a mystery Lancaster. Okay, um, this, this was an accidental uh, discovery, which led to something bigger. Um, we, can blame, we can blame Peter for this in his operations record book. He was looking at an operations record book for the heavy bomber replacement training unit. And... Uh, he found one entry in there for the 1st of December 1944, which was intriguing. A Lancaster bomber piloted by Wing Commander McKinley and a crew of 13 landed at NADSAB on the 1st of December. The aircraft is on a world tour, testing all the latest navigational equipment. Now, we're all aware of two Lancasters that came to Australia, mostly for uh, raising war bonds and general propaganda. Um, one of which is still exists in the Australian War Museum. But I had never heard of a third one anywhere near Australia. So we had a look at, uh, I had to, had to try and find out what this one was. Surprisingly, I. Uh, used that uh, the business of a crew of 13 was a, was a clue that this was not on a normal bombing, a bomber a mission. Um, and the business about the latest navigational equipment. It led me to um, an outfit called, just a moment, I'll put it up on screen in a minute. Um, it started at an outfit in Shawbury in the UK, which by 1944 was started to be called the Empire Air Navigation School. It went through about five different names, if you're trying to look it up. Um, and they were running this, um, this project to fly around the world. It appears that they were trying to map uh, and out navigate with extraordinary accuracy. And one of the things they were doing was mapping the Earth's magnetic field to make uh, compass readings more, more uh, accurate. Okay, uh, this is Lancaster PD-328, is a Lancaster Mark, Mark I. And it was delivered to uh, uh, RAF Waddington where they pulled it to pieces, it was brand new. They, they started taking the pieces again. They took the dorsal gun turret out and they replaced that with a large second astrodome. Uh, presumably this is not one where, where you would stand with a, a sextant. It had uh, more sophisticated equipment in it. And it would, um, they, they apparently used both astrodomes to cross check each, each other. In an October 1944, the aircraft was by now called Ares, um, set off on a, an RAF circumnavigation of the world. This is quite a story that, uh, that I'd never heard of before. It set off westwards and uh, flew across the Atlantic uh, via Iceland and Newfoundland, across Canada, down into the US, to Hawaii and then via Samoa and New Zealand to Australia. The idea was the real reason they had 13, 13 crew crewmen in it is that um, they were all navigators, except the pilot and flight engineer. Um, and they're all using different sets of equipment. There is a list of that I have, which is mind boggling. Um, there were even um, uh, magnetic anomaly detectors. I don't know how they worked on board the aircraft. It went round the world in uh, about 53 days, uh, setting a number of records, it included Australia, uh, the UK to Australia in 72 hours. 
No, that was the, uh, sorry, that was the return journey, eight, Australia to the UK in 72 hours, knocking over 50 hours off the former. The problem I have is that uh, it did all of this. It went all over the place. Um, I'll show you some more. Okay, that was taken in Laverton in 19, early 1945. And it was a picture of G for George. But in the background, you can see Aries. Um, so it was in Australia for quite a few weeks. Uh, much of the information I have on it came from this document here, which was a RAF Historical Society seminar in the 1990s, held jointly with the Royal Institute of Navigation and the Guild of Air Pilots and Air Navigators. Uh, it's about um, it's about 250 pages. That's just an image from the, the cover. After it returned to uh, Shawbury in the UK, after all of that um, uh, adventure, in which case it also stopped in various places to do uh, training sessions and um, it, uh, it didn't just fly around the world. It, uh, it was at NADZAB on its way somewhere else. Um, spent quite a long time flying around most of the Air Force bases in Australia. When it returned to Shawbury, they pulled it to pieces again uh, to improve its, um, its function. It was a bit crowded with 13 people on board. They took the nose off it and put a nose similar to the Lancastrian uh, commercial airliner, which extended the nose a bit and gave them a lot more room and they also removed a lot of other equipment. By this time, the war was coming to an end. So they took out the gun turret, the remaining gun turret at the back. And they overhauled all of the equipment and put in new equipment. They, they were designing equipment as they went along. To give it as much fuel uh, capacity as possible, because it was going to be doing very, very long flights, um, they extended the fuel tanks and most of the bomb bay was converted into a permanent fuel tank. It increased the weight of the aircraft considerably. So by that time, the, the uh, prototype of the Lincoln, the Lancaster Mark IV, uh, had flown and they were building a, a small pre-production batch. They fitted the, land, uh, the landing gear from the Lincoln onto this Lancaster. Then it set off across the Atlantic again. And if I can show this, if you can read, read some of that. No. This was its score sheet on the, on the side of the nose. You can see it where it left Newfoundland and Iceland. I thought that was out of, out of order, but that was after they, uh, they left the yeah. UK and down here is where it arrived in Australia. And then, yeah. and then you can see the places that it went practically all over the world. Yeah, while it was, while it was in this second phase as with the Lancastrian nose and all that sort of um, the second version of the aircraft. It uh, spent quite a lot of time in uh, Alaska and, and Canada and made several trips to the geographic North Pole and to the North Magnetic Pole, um, trying to locate the nature and the exact location of the North, North Magnetic Pole. Um, there's also uh, spent months in in uh, it spent months in that on that uh, part of the project um, back through the Azores, Bahamas, and Gibraltar and France. Then it went from uh, England to uh, Cape Town, set a new England to Cape Town record. Uh, on the way, it went via Cairo, so it set a non-stop record, the first non-stop flight from Cap Cairo to Cape. Uh, then through uh, Transvaal, Southern Rhodesia and Sudan. 
I think that's where they stopped recording it because it probably, um, it seems to have gone to a lot of other places as well. It also had uh, a great deal on this second, in this second career, it had a great deal of um, modifications made for Arctic flying uh, because they're going to spend a lot of time in the Arctic Circle. Hmm. Um, it eventually had a range of about 5,000 miles. Maximum takeoff weight was 32 tonnes. And typical cruising speed was 240 knots at 12,000 feet. It has a whole catalogue of uh, firsts and um, uh, records. Now, my problem is that um, it's very well documented in its second life form. But the original one that came to Australia uh, was in wartime. And they don't seem to have... Um, I, I can't seem to find very much information at, at, on it at all, exactly where it went. There are odd records of it turning up here and there. Um, the photos that I've just shown you are about the only ones of any use um, that I can find in its original one. There are a number of photos of it in the modified nose version, in that version. But there's very, very little of it in, in that original that original configuration. So if anybody comes across anything like that, I'd be interested in finding out as much as I can. Um, if anybody's interested, I can also send you the, this uh, document that I've got here. There's a number of other things on, on it. There's sites for there's a site for the uh, Empire Navigation School. And that has its own set of history as well. And it does mention the Aries flights in, in, um, in some detail. Um, if you like, I'll just read out the uh, navigation fit, which was installed most of it at Farnborough. Um, direct reading compasses included a P10, B16, N1 and O1151A. And these were joined by three distant reading ones, the Air Ministry DRC and Pioneer Fluxgate and Magnuson types. An Admiralty RAE special horizontal axis gyro was fitted as well as the master gyro, together with two astro compasses, one inverted, two Mark 9A sextants and a link averaging octant, H2S Mark 2B mapping radar, um, and all the standard uh, Lancaster fit of navigation aids, which included uh, G, Loran, AN, APN4, T1154R1155, TR1196 radios, AYF, SCR718 radio and radar ultimate, altimeters, a modified APA, um, AMI, and a Mark II drift recorder. There was also a flux valve dip meter and a three axis flux valve magnetometer to determine dip and magnetic field strength. Much of the navigation and trials equipment was recorded on film at an auto observer position, which means they had a camera pointing at a, a panel of instruments. Um, both position and heading information in the polar regions were to be highly reliant on the use of the sextant and astro compass. And in permanent summer daylight at high altitude, it was deemed necessary for the sun and moon to lie on bearings of not less than 45 degrees of each other to establish acceptable fixes. So they had to fly on particular days. There were five consecutive days in May, May 1945 and after that for lessening periods. And it goes on with lots more stuff about uh, how the sequence of uh, taking, uh, uh, the sequence of take of collecting the data from all the different um, navigation systems they had. That's yeah. enough for now. Yeah, I think uh, we're running pretty late. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much for that. Um, That's right. Okay, thanks. Good evening, everyone.
unlike some other members who have flown all sorts of fascinating, powerful, big, fast aeroplanes, I've only ever flown single engine light aircraft. And I want to talk about my favourite tailwheel light aircraft, which is the Oster. The Oster story began in 1938 when the American Taylor Craft Aviation Corporation set up a subsidiary in England uh, called Taylor Craft Aeroplanes Brackets England Limited to manufacture the Taylor Craft model CMD. And it was from these American designs that the Oster evolved. The model CMD had been designed by Clarence Taylor, uh, who also designed the original Cub. So the Oster and the Taylor Cub, and later, which was later the Piper Cub, are cousins. And if you compare the shape of the tailplane on a Cub with the shape of the tailplane on an Oster, it's not hard to see the resemblance. In 1941, it was decided to call all future aircraft built in England by Taylor Craft Osters. So there were Taylor Craft Osters up until 1946. And that's when the company changed its name to Oster Aircraft Limited. In 1940, the Taylor Craft, Taylor Craft Aeroplanes England Limited received orders from the British Air Ministry for air observation post aircraft. And for the next five years produced the Marks I through to the Mark V Osters. The best known military Oster in Australia was the Mark III which was used by the RAAF number 16 and 17 AOP flights and supported the Australian Army in the Pacific Theatre. Now, on the screen now is a Mark III Oster. And um, just to point out a few little things, because we'll compare this with the later Osters. Um, first of all, the shorter undercarriage legs, just in front of the windscreen, the thing sticking up is a fuel gauge. It's just a simple cork and a stick that goes up and down. Um, flat windscreen, uh, different to the later Osters, and a relatively short um, tail fin with a mass balance uh, on the rudder. Okay, so a total of 56 Mark III's like this one were transferred from RAF service to the RAAF in 1944-1945. The last two uh, Mark III's retired from the RAAF in 1959. And one of those, which is A1141, the one after the one on the screen, um, is now in the Army Aviation Museum um, at Oki. Many, Marks, many of the, the 56 Mark III's ended up on the Australian Civil Register and several were used as glider tow planes in the 1960s and 1970s. They were well su suited for this duty as they could tow at 40 knots or even less, down to 35 knots actually, um, which suited some of the, uh, the older gliders that were around in the 1960s like the, uh, the Gruner. Okay, so here's the flight deck of a Mark III Oster. Um, a little bit different from the later Osters, you can see that in the lower centre there is the throttle, which is a quadrant type throttle. The later Osters had a push-pull throttle. Um, and you can just see at the very top there the, the fuel gauge sticking up. Yeah, okay. So here's an Oster towing a Kookaburra glider at Corinda. I took this about 1967, it was. And yes, that storm you can see building up uh, that hit with a bang about three hours later. The, um, following the end of World War II, Oster developed the wartime military models uh, into a large number of variants for civil use. And during the next 15 years, Oster Aircraft Limited developed over 30 different civil models and variants of which 16 types were produced in any sort of numbers. And of the other 14 or so, development didn't get past the prototype stage or at best maybe two or three of that model were sold. Some of the more successful post-war Osters included the J1 Autocrat, J1B Aglet, the J1N Alpha, the J4 Archer, the J5 Adventurer, the J5B Autocar, the J5F Aglet Trainer, the J5G Autocar, the J5L Aglet 
again, an aglet trainer, the A5P order car, and the D5160. And this was in addition to the military AOP uh, types that uh, Oster continued to manufacture up till the end of the 1950s. The number of, it's really mind boggling, I think, <laughs> the, the, the number of model changes during this period is a stark contrast to, for example, um, single engine Cessnas where there were relatively few changes. And it's no wonder Oster never really made much money in the post-war years. The difference between the various Oster types were many. The first post-war Osters were two-seaters and then they progressed to three slash four-seaters and finally became true four-seaters. The earlier Osters had split flats but then, in an effort to produce a cheaper aeroplane, the J2, J3 and J4 models were manufactured without flaps. Flaps were reintroduced on the J5 Adventure and all the following Osters had flaps. Earlier models had the prominent mass balance on the rudder, which I pointed out earlier, while later models had a taller tail with a, an aerodynamic rudder balance. A number of, in fact, I it's an amazing number of different engines were used in Osters, and these included the 55 horsepower Lycoming that was used in the Taylorcraft Model C, the 75 horsepower Continental, 90 horsepower Blackburn Cirrus Minor, 130 horsepower Gypsy Major 1, um, 145 horsepower Gypsy Major, I think that was a Major 3, and the 155 horsepower Blackburn Cirrus Major. Uh, that powered the J5G. However, the Gypsy Major engine was the most commonly used um, power plant. Another change introduced was the lengthening of the undercarriage legs on the various J5 models. And this greatly reduced the tendency to bounce on landing. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. In the case of the J5F, the standard 36 foot wingspan was reduced to 32 feet to increase the rate of roll and achieve aerobatic capability. This was an attempt to market the J5F as a trainer in which spins and aerobatics could be taught. Unfortunately, the result was a mediocre aerobatic performer, which had lost the Oster's greatest virtue, its short landing and takeoff capability. And models from the J5 onwards had the option of an electric starter. Amazing, you know, building all those aeroplanes didn't have electric starters. One interesting feature of the Oster evolution was the fuel tank arrangement. In the earlier two seat models, <clears throat> the main tank was in the fuselage, forward of the cockpit. This had a rudimentary float and stick fuel indicator, which I pointed out um, before, immediately in front of the windshield. And there was a second tank in the fuselage immediately behind the two seats. And the second tank didn't have any fuel indicator, so takeoffs and landings were done on the front tank. When rear seating was introduced, um, the rear tank had to be moved, so it was it was relocated to a pod under the fuselage. However, from the J5B model onwards, the firewall was reconfigured to make room for a starter motor. There was no longer enough space for the fuel tank, the front fuel tank. So both the fuel tanks were relocated to the wings. So you'd have to wonder, why didn't they put the fuel tanks in the wings in the first place? Okay, so I took this picture uh, 1973 at Broken Hill, at the Broken Hill Gliding Club. You can see that the Oster's got a tow rope behind it. I, I didn't use a telephoto lens. This was taken with a standard lens. And I reckon that the wingtip was no more than 20 foot above the ground. You can't see the ground there. And I was told that the guy flying it had flown uh, jets or something in Korea. Uh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> A, um, after World War II, Oster aircraft continu continued to struggle financially. And what was essentially a 1930s rag and bone design tail wheel with a steel tube fuselage, wooden wings and all fabric covering and mechanical brakes, mechanical brakes I should say, 
was just couldn't compete with the tricycle undercarriage Cessnas and uh, Pipers. So um, inevitably, Oster Aircraft Limited was taken over by Beagle in 1960. Um, Beagle lasted 10 years. They also couldn't compete with the American onslaught and they folded in 1970. Now, I'll just point out, so on, on the picture on your screen now, just the, the, um, the, the differences there compared with the earlier Mark III Oster. Um, on this one, you can just make out the, the fuel tank in the pod just behind the, the, uh, the right undercarriage leg there. Um, a taller tail fin with no mass balance on the rudder. Uh, curved wind, windshield. Um, tanks are in the wings, but you can't tell that from the photo. Anyway, so that's, um, you know, a few of the, the differences. One of the great features of the Oscar, uh, particularly the earlier and lighter models, like the, uh, the J3 and the, uh, the J1, the, the Mark III and the J1 models, was its short landing and takeoff capability. Now, for example, the Mark III stalled at 32 knots clean and uh, stalled at 28 knots with full flat. Approach speed was 40 knots. Uh, however, military pilots were trained to approach at 35 knots if they really wanted to land. One memorable feature of the Oster was the brakes. They were mechanical and they got out of adjustment very quickly. Of course, the gypsy engine Osters had a tendency to swing to the right on takeoff. The left brake got out of adjustment very quickly and it was usually the one that uh, didn't, didn't work more often than not. And my first encounter with a, an Oster was about 50 years ago, and I wanted to get an endorsement in, a, in an ex um, uh, Air Force Mark III so I could tow gliders in it. Um, the first time I hopped in the glider or in the aeroplane with the instructor, I found it impossible to taxi in a straight line due to the combination of a, a moderate breeze and no left brake. However, um, after a time, I learned to compensate for the lack of brakes and uh, it became not much of a problem eventually. Some people found using the flaps a bit tricky at first. The flap lever was located above the pilot's left shoulder. <clears throat> the end of the flap lever had to be extended forward first to unlatch it and then pull down to lower the flaps. Now, logically, you'd say, yeah, you use your left arm to do that. Um, however, this involved a very uncomfortable contortion of the left arm in the limited space available. The trick was re to reach across with your right arm to lower the flaps and it was easy. Would have made much more sense to locate the flap lever above the pilot's right shoulder where it would have been accessible from both seats because all Osters and most Osters had dual control. A challenging feature of the earlier Osters, again, such as the Mark III and J1s, with the shorter, uh, shorter undercarriage legs was the landing. The undercarriage springing was provided by two large bungee cords and there was little or no damping. And for this reason, the aeroplane was very prone to bounce on touchdown. If you bounced once and didn't, and didn't take corrective action, the Mark III Oster would continue to bounce and each bounce got worse as the nose got pointed higher and higher into the air. The only remedy was a burst of throttle and try again. Unless the stick was hard back against the stop, when the wheels touched in a three-point landing, a bounce was guaranteed. I don't know for sure, but I, I really suspect that the reason Osters were seldom, if ever, used as trainers um, was for this reason, even though almost all Osters were fitted with dual controls. It wasn't unknown for a bungee cord to snap. However, there were safety uh, cables to limit the distance the fuse large dropped and hopefully prevent a prop strike. I don't think you can see this yet. No, you can't on that picture. You can't see the safety cables, but they are there. So that's the Oster. And I'd have to say, of the tail dragger types I've flown, <clears throat> Tiger Moth was definitely the most fun. 
The chipmunk was by far the most pleasant to fly, but despite all its annoying quirks and, and, and strange personality, the oyster gets my vote as the most interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. I was just going to tell Laurie quickly that my mate Trevor Weber had a uh, uh, an oyster was VHCGD, it was a uh, shave four, but he uh, rolled that into a tr uh, dead tree down in the water when he was 68 and killed himself. I was supposed to be oh, on the flight. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I can tell you, but the fuel tank he had was above him and, and he actually didn't actually get killed. The uh, tank ruptured. It was held in suspension upside down. It was rescued for people on the road, but he died from pneumonia from inhaling the fuel uh, yep. fumes about a week later. Right. Yeah, so, yeah but very tragic. But uh, I supply with him in the thing. But anyway. I can't give it a little bit different. Um, talk about DC nine flying. Come in Townsville. For those who don't know Townsville, it's got main runways, runway one nine three five. And um, it's in the south, of course. And um, at the terminal is on the right, uh, the eastern side of the runway. And uh, we're coming to land one evening. I was the first officer at the time. And we came to land runway 19. Usually you turn off about two thirds of the way down the runway to turn left toward the terminal building. And uh, just a short taxi to the terminal. In this particular case, this night, the captain rolled all the way through to the end and uh, so taking that normal turn. And so at the end, we turned left and then left again to taxi back to the terminal car of the main runway. It was a dark night, <clears throat> and after taxiing a fair distance long, we came to the first taxiway on our right. It commenced to turn in toward it, assuming it was one to the taxi to the terminal. And uh, as we got into the turn, we realized, oh, this is a very short run taxiway. Um, and uh, then we saw it, the taxiway had a bend to the left in it. Well, that's okay, we'll go there and then Nick will hit the other taxiway and get in. So uh, we continued, turned left, and just shortly after we turned left, suddenly there's water spurt, spurting all around. We realised that we'd taxied into and over the bird bar. This was built uh, there to wash the salt water off Neptunes, maritime reconnaissance Neptunes. They used to fly a lot of very low altitude stuff, apparently, searching for submarines. Anyway, a lot of water jets there and they just sprayed over the aeroplane and we continued through it and uh, turned right and into the terminal. Um, there's nothing to do with this continuous terminal. We just got there, parked the aeroplane in the terminal, dripping water. There's a little ending to this story. About 35 years later, I was down at the Evans Head fly-in a couple of years ago and over dinner one night chatting to some guys I just met there and uh, Tom and on they turned to the air traffic controllers. And one of them, um, he had been in Townsville, so that prompted me to tell this little story I've just told you. He said, ah, I was in the tower that night. I remember it. And we had decided whether we'd build TAA with a big bill for the, um, all the waste of distilled water. <laughs> so there's a short one from me. <laughs> I've got others on my sleeve another time. So last speaker tonight. Is Roger Marks. Okay, I'll take you through this PDF from the start. I'll go back to uh, page one. Um, when I put Queen of the Air Force together in 1990 something, um, there was a mystery uh, flight diagram and associated single direct vertical aerial photograph of a, as, as you're seeing there, a flight diagram showing just Elliot airstrip and clearly up Cape York way. And the little ring shows the spot where the um, direct vertical photograph was taken. Uh, not, uh, not very easy to see exactly where, but south of a, of a prominent creek called Bridge Creek and close, of course, to the, very close, of course, to the Overland Telegraph line, which of course doesn't work, but is a, an historic animal of the day. Now, that was the single, that was the flight diagram. I'll show you the photograph itself. As in, in the Queensland airfields, I put this statement together thinking, oh, well, some, somebody will give me the answer. Somebody will tell me who put that, uh, that clearing together and when and why. Just very quickly, 
those, these are a couple of map sections. Now, there's the photograph itself. Clearly, the, 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 the straight section through here is part of the straight overland telegraph line with an associated maintenance track along it. Um, now, there are some sections of the, um, uh, the uh, telegraph line that are straight and there are curved sections. So clearly, this has to be on a piece of straight. So uh, we've been trying to work out where the hell it was. And we there are several spots, but I think one of the possibles is th this is the northern section where you can see the overland telegraph line running down through there. And over on here, the red thing is the bypass road to the Jardine Ferry over the Jardine River. Now, the next section south of there, south of there is there. And the, again, the overland telegraph line through here curved bits, as you will see, and straight bits, and the bypass road to the ferry. The next bit is the southern section, like so. Now, um, knowing the um, features of the, uh, the uh, camera and so on, it is possible to plot that the representative single square photograph is something like that there. And I have located this position where I think it probably was, was uh, taken. But Keep, keep, bear in mind that I'm not fully uh, clear on, on that. The next one is the closing strip, closing uh, swing there. Oh no, this is this is the same spot on a section of the one to 50,000 typo mapping, which does carry um, 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 contours and, uh, and so on. So it is feasible to inspect various spots on the map where this thing could have fitted. This is one of them. Now, the last section shows this like so. And this is a Google Earth uh, plot with the, with the uh, square just overlaid on a, on, a, um, on a screenshot. I think that possibly this is the spot where that airfield photo was showing, um, but it's not clear. And, I, and I, as I thought at the start, someone will tell me where it was taken and when and why, and that has not happened. So um, over the years, I've had several efforts to awaken some interest and I've asked the obvious places. Uh, there are two possibilities, really. Uh, the photograph, going back to the photo, the photograph was taken in July of 1950. And clearly there are two intersecting strips and a cleared central area here. These two white lines are quite <clears throat> likely tracks, access tracks from this um, disturbed area here, which probably was a campsite for the exercise of putting in this strip. Um, so there are various spots along the mapping that this sort of thing will fit. And the one that I showed you just there is, is probably uh, a fairly um, uh, likely one when it came time, during the wartime period, it track across the, the uh, Jardine Ferry at a very uh, un, 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 unreliable floating, um, floating bridge, which uh, was fraught with all sorts of trouble. So at some stage later, somebody decided they'd get a sensible ferry running and was responsible for putting in this road, which happens to have teed off in this area. I think it's fairly likely that whoever chose that position uh, chose it because there was some clearing of a sort there, the name was clearing for the strip. Anyway, I'm not clear yet on exactly where it was. So if anyone can give me steerage, I would be pleased to get it. Mm. Um, Roger, I, I, I camped on the side of that old telegraph track back in um, December, back in 1966. We're going to Cape York with myself and my brother. And uh, just after that, uh, the people came in behind. Well, it was actually Davison, the bloke that made that movie across the top. He told me that there was actually a bulldozer that came a couple of days later because the anthills had built up. He had to knock off the top of the anthills on the track we drove in those days. But there was a bulldozer that came in through, and he asked the driver, because uh, that what he was doing, he says, I was going north to make an airfield. But that was 1966. December. Okay, this photo was uh, July 1950. 
Yeah, well, and so that, that had to precede that. So where this, well, that was, I don't know where the boat was going for the airstrip, maybe it's that, uh, uh, you know, clear something that's up further north, but uh, it's unusual to see a bulldozer on the track, that's all. Yeah, it was yeah. a pretty remote track on those days. Yeah. I've asked the main roads people that in case they were relevant in choosing the yacht take point or the bypass road to the Jardine Ferry. Because I say again, it's possible that because that old strip clearing was there and realised the place was abandoned, cleared, but abandoned. And it's possible that during the latter stage of 1940, uh, during 1945, for example, it's possible that the clearing was done. And of course, the thing lapsed for whatever purpose. So again, someday I hope I get the answers. That's all, thanks. Roger, can you just go back to the aerial photo and show me that? Yep, sure. Yep. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I've just been looking on Google Earth. I did find something that looks like an old airstrip, but it's it's not the right orientation and there's creek either side of it. And it's only a single, yeah. Yeah. A single one <laughs> near, near Cockatoo Creek. There's a, what looks like could be a very old airfield. Okay, anyone got any questions? Thanks Sorry, uh, Jeff, I, I was muted there, I didn't realise. Jeff, just before you go, could I just ask you, so Aries, is that the Lancaster that came to grief at Evans Head? No, it was S for sure. One of the two that came to Australia. I forget which one of the two that came to Australia. Oh, okay, right. Yep. I just wondered, that's all. Yep. Right, thanks. Okay, well, thank you to all our speakers tonight. Um, it's been quite interesting. Thanks very much, everyone.